We're now going to look at mechanisms of heat gain. How does the body gain heat? And the first one I want to look at is the metabolic gain of heat. So what metabolic mechanisms are going to give rise to the generation of heat? Well really the literal answer to that is all metabolic processes will generate heat. So you probably remember that all cells contain mitochondria. All cells, certainly most cells, contain mitochondria that produce energy. The reason I'm hesitating actually, I'm just wondering if red blood cells do, I'm not quite sure. I think they probably do. But all cells contain mitochondria. Liver cells contain lots of mitochondria. Muscle cells contain lots of mitochondria. Uh, cells in the kidney that are responsible for active transport contain a lot of mitochondria. The mitochondria are generating the energy that the cell needs. And you might remember that basically glucose is combined with oxygen and this gives us carbon dioxide and water and it also gives us energy as a well as the whole, the whole point of the reaction, the whole point is to generate energy. So energy is essential for all life giving physiological processes. We need to have the energy. And all energy, if you think back to your physics, all energy, all energy chains end in heat. So whenever energy is used, it's going to end up as heat. So for example, if you think of water running down a hill, when the water is up the hill, it will contain gravitational potential energy. And as it runs down the hill, that will be converted into heat energy. And it's the same way, the chemical reactions going on inside the cells of the body end up, in, end up as heat. So you start off with potential chemical energy and you end up with heat energy. So all living tissues are going to generate heat. This is called metabolic heat. So in the liver, there's a lot of biochemical reactions going on. So this means that the liver generates a lot of the body heat because there's a lot of active biochemistry there. Now, skeletal muscles will also generate a lot of heat. Obviously, they'll generate more when they're working. So when you go out for a jog, or you go cycling, and you're using your muscles, you're producing a lot of energy, the kinetic energy and the chemical energy in that muscle movement will end up as heat. And you end up with uh, heat production. But even when muscles aren't actively moving around. Muscles always have a degree of tone, there's always a muscle tone. So muscles are producing heat even when we're comparatively relaxed. Now the combination of all these things going on in the body is described as the metabolic rate. Now the basal metabolic rate is the amount of metabolism going on in the body just to maintain essential life-giving processes. Basal metabolism. Any exercise or activity we do on top of that is additional metabolism. So it's the metabolic rate that is determining the amount of heat that is produced. The metabolic rate is high, a lot of heat will be produced. The metabolic rate is low, less heat will be produced. And there's various factors influence this. For example, on the notes here I've mentioned uh, thyroid hormones. Now, when people go to live in cold environments, like if you want to walk across the Arctic or something, you'll actually start producing more thyroid hormone. Now, do you remember the function of thyroxine, the thyroid hormone? Well, thyroxine stimulates metabolism in all cells. It is a metabolic stimulant. It increases the metabolic rate of the cells. So you will produce more heat if you have high levels of thyroxine. More quickly, if you go into a cold environment, the sympathetic nervous system will actually start working and you'll get sympathetic stimulation of metabolism. So there's various factors which are influencing metabolic rate. And actually, I think I'll mention another one here. I think I'll mention brown adipose tissue. Brown adipose tissue, you probably noticed, you can abbreviate it to BAT. Brown adipose tissue. Now, brown adipose tissue is very interesting. As the name suggests, it is brown fatty tissue. 
And this is responsible for what is called NST, or one aspect of NST, non-shivering thermogenesis. Now, newborn babies have quite a lot of active brown adipose tissue. And, and this is carried on in, into young childhood as well. So babies and young children have a lot of brown adipose tissue. Now, the sole, pu the sole function of adipose, brown adipose tissue, or the prime function of brown adipose tissue, is to generate heat. That is what it does. It is thermogenic tissue. It is there just to generate heat. And of course, in doing so, it uses up a lot of energy. So when a baby's born, if the environment is cold, and babies, of course, are very prone to losing their body temperature, the brown adipose tissue will start metabolising rapidly and produce quite a lot of heat. The prime function of brown adipose tissue. Now, as we get older, we lose the activity of the brown adipose tissue. So in childhood, if children live in a cold environment, the thermogenesis from brown adipose tissue can perhaps double their heat production. It can increase it by 100%. In adults, the mechanism still does work to a degree. Although in adults, the brown adipose tissue is much less active than in children. And in adults, it probably only contributes 10 or 15%, uh, makes up a 10 or 15% increase in, in non-shivering thermogenesis when we're exposed to cold environments. But there's definitely a, a factor there in adults. Now, brown adipose cells have numerous small vacuoles containing fat, and they have numerous large mitochondria. So you can see there in the cell, if you've got the vacuoles containing the fat, that is the fuel, the metabolic substrate, and the mitochondria are able to produce heat energy from using the fat. So they have fat and they have mitochondria all in one cells, all in one cell to make it a thermogenic tissue. And the brown adipose tissue is stimulated by activity of the sympathetic nervous system. So a very important mechanism in children, a less important mechanism in adults. Now, in addition to gaining heat from its own metabolic processes, the body can also gain heat from the environment. So obviously, especially if it's a warm day, there's going to be a lot of infrared radiation from the sun, and that's going to warm us up. If the environment round about us is warm, the warm bodies round about us will also radiate heat, and that will help to warm us up as well. So we do have some heat gains from the environment, especially from warm environments. Another place we can get heat gain from is hot food and drinks. So when we drink a hot cup of tea or eat some hot food, then that contains heat which is going into the body and, and that will also warm us up. So we can also have heat gains from the environment as well as heat gains as a result of metabolic processes. Now, in addition to getting heat from the outside and generating its own heat, the body needs to be able to retain heat as well. And what we're looking at here is a section of the skin. You can probably see the epidermis on top here, sweat glands. But notice here that there's a large area of yellow material. This is the subcutaneous adipose tissue. So underneath the skin, the epidermis and the dermis, there is a layer of subcutaneous adipose tissue. Now this layer varies in thickness depending on the part of the body and of course, of course it also varies in thickness between individuals. People that are more obese will often have a thicker layer of subcutaneous adipose tissue than people that are thin. In addition to this, women tend to store more fat subcutaneously whereas men often store excess fat in the abdomen. But the key thing to notice here is that subcutaneous fat, in fact all fat, is a very good insulator of heat. So this keeps heat in the body and stops it being lost through the surface of the skin. To, to a large extent, it is a good insulator of heat.
Now, most heat is lost through the surface of the body. So body mass is also going to determine the amount of heat that is lost. Bodies with large mass have actually got more heat in them. So it will take longer for them to cool down. Bodies with small mass, because there is less matter containing heat, are going to contain less heat so it can cool down more quickly. Now what this means is that adults will only lose heat relatively slowly, whereas children can lose heat relatively quickly. This is because of the amount of body mass. But there's another key factor here, and that is surface area to volume ratio. Now, given that heat is lost from the surface of the body, the more surface area there is relative to the amount of mass there is in the body, the more heat will be lost. Now, I want to illustrate this with some books. So if we take one book here, we could work out its surface area. It would be that surface, that surface, that surface, that surface, that surface, and of course, and of course this surface. So the book has a particular volume and it has a particular surface area. But if we increase the size of the body by putting on, in this case, another book, then this surface area and this surface area are no longer exposed to the outside so they will no longer lose heat. So what we have here is a larger volume of body mass and that is going to give us a proportionally smaller surface area. So with a small body the surface area to volume ratio will be large, that is there will be a large surface area to a small volume, but with a body of greater volume the surface area to volume ratio will be relatively smaller. There will be a relatively smaller surface area. So if we have a large body, as in the case of an adult here, then there's a relatively large volume, but a relatively, a relatively small surface area. So children will have a large surface area to volume ratio. Adults will have a smaller surface area to volume ratio. Now as you increase the linear dimensions, you actually increase the surface area by a factor of 4. So if you double the size linearly, you increase the surface area by a factor of 4. But if you double the size in a linear dimension again, you actually increase the volume by a factor of 8. So small bodies have a large surface area to volume ratio Larger bodies have a small surface area to volume ratio. So there's some important clinical applications here in caring for children. One is that they will lose body heat very quickly in cold environments. And as we'll see later, this is especially the case if the child is wet for whatever reason. Especially very young babies, neonates, are very prone to hypothermia despite the fact that they have the brown adipose tissue to generate the non-shivering thermogenesis. So as soon as babies are born, that's why we always wrap them up quickly, put them next to the mother's body to keep them warm. So children can lose heat quickly because of their relatively large surface area to volume ratio. And because children have a small mass, they can also gain heat very quickly. Now, sometimes when you're caring for children with infections, they can develop pyrexias, of course. And you can take the temperature and find it, say, 37.5 or 38. A bit hot, but maybe nothing to get too worried about. And in an adult, for the temperature to rise up to, say, 40 degrees centigrade, very often would take a few hours. But in children, because there's a relatively small mass to warm up, then they can increase their body temperatures very quickly and you get into a situation where a pyrexia in a child becomes a febrile convulsion threatening pyrexia. When children get too hot they can have febrile convulsions and their temperatures can warm up very quickly. So be very careful when you're working with children because they can develop potentially dangerous pyrexias very quickly because they have got a relatively small mass and that can warm up relatively quickly.